All right, I gotta be honest. I'm impressed that you're even here. I mean, who comes to church on New Year's? Well done. I actually think I know who comes to church on New Year's. It's people that, like, this is your jam. This is your habit. You wouldn't miss church come hell or high water. If the doors are open, you're there. If you're on vacation, you'll find a local church or watch online. This is just what you do. But I suspect there's another group of people here who heard Ashley's challenge in the Christmas message to not miss a single week the first two months of the year, to create a habit. And if you're here, good on you. Both of you have one thing in common. That is, you don't just want God to bless you. You want to bless God. Like, I I know who this crowd is. You want your life to matter beyond your life. And so you want to make church a significant part of what you do, being with the people of God. That's good. How do you turn a new habit into a long-term habit? That's what I want to talk about. And there is, there is an answer of how people go from this, like a habit that they want to do, and it's not your motives. I've been at this game for decades now. I've seen people come. I've seen people go. They all have good motives. Your motives really don't matter. Your intentions don't matter. Your habits matter. So how do you turn a new habit into a long-term habit? And I want to tell you how by telling you a story. It's a true story that took place 504 years ago. Some of you are doing the math. That is 1519. A guy by the name of Hernando Cortez landed on the shores of Yucatan in Mexico. His goal was gold. He was a conquistador who had heard about the fabled gold of the Aztecs, and he was there to conquer the Aztecs and take their gold. He had 500 soldiers, 100 sailors, and 11 ships, and and not really a chance. I mean, the Aztecs had been around for 600 years. They had been a dominant force in all of middle America, and some of his soldiers thought, there's no way we can do this. And so they planned on taking some ships and going back to Cuba with them. When Cortez learned about their plots, he gathered all the soldiers, all the sailors on the shore of Yucatan, and he ordered the sailors to burn the ships. He burned 10 of the 11 ships. The one he kept was to send back what was called the Royal Fifth to Spain, because the king of Spain demanded 20% of all that the conquistadors conquered. One ship to send back the gold. His soldiers ask, and you would have asked too if you were there, uh, how are we going to get home? Here's his response. If we get home, it will be on their ships. <laughs> I, like, I love that. Now, I don't like what Cortes did, but I love how he did it. Because that's the secret of turning a new habit into an old habit. That's the secret of not just being blessed by God, but being a blessing to God, to build his kingdom here on this earth. And it actually, there's a a lesson here. Here's the lesson. Retreat is easy when you keep an open option. This works with dieting as well. Like if you keep snacks on the counter, you're not going to lose weight. You got to eliminate the options for retreat because retreat isn't just easy. It is inevitable when you keep your options open. So if your New Year's resolutions are to get to the gym or to get a raise or to stay married in a difficult marriage, you've got to eliminate all other options. My wife and I, we've never used the word divorce. Murder is more of an option in our family than divorce. We're we're just not even going to bring it up because until you eliminate all the options, retreat is just too easy and it becomes inevitable. And it reminds me of another ancient story that goes back 2,000 years, 49 BC. Julius Caesar, before he was Julius Caesar, was fighting on the frontiers of Gaul. That's France, Germany, Belgium, all that that area. He was fighting a vicious enemy. But his most dangerous enemy was not in front of him. It was behind him in Rome. 
His political adversaries figured out a way to manipulate the system to oust him from his governorship and they stripped him of his titles. And now he has to come home to defend himself. He can either come home alone and lose everything or he can take his army that was loyal to him and march them right into the bowels of Rome. The problem was there was a law of the Romans that you cannot cross the river Rubicon into Italian territory with a standing army. That would be interpreted immediately as an act of rebellion and sedition, and they had a very cruel and vicious punishment of death for that particular crime. But Julius decided, you know what? I, I, I can't, I, I'm not gonna lose everything. I'm gonna try this one last shot. It might be the death of me, but, but I'm gonna go all in. All the chips on the table, push to the center and says, I'm gonna make my bet, and he did. And Julius Caesar bet it all, and you know history well enough to know, it worked for him. I, I, I don't have any intention or <laughs> like image of grandeur that I could become an emperor. Don't even wanna be. But what he did, crossing the Rubicon, with these famous words, the die is cast. That was me 40 years ago. When my parents got divorced, I had to make a decision between living with mom and living with dad. But my decision was not mom or dad. My decision was Jesus and everybody else. And my decision was not made based on who I liked better or who I felt more comfortable with. It was, it was decided because I wanted, even that young age as a teenager, I wanted Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And I would make every decision based upon that. The die is cast. That was my Rubicon. And from that day till now, I, I have no plan B. Like there's no other option for me but being faithful to Jesus Christ. I don't know what your options are. But if you leave options on the table, retreat is inevitable. And Jesus demands from you full loyalty. The Rubicon for me was my parents' divorce. The Rubicon for Julius Caesar was literally the river. But there was another Rubicon 80 years after Caesar. And it was a guy from a faraway place, a backwater of Israel called Galilee. His name was Simon you know him better as Peter the Apostle. His Rubicon was in the middle of Jesus' ministry. He had just performed his really most famous miracle, feeding the 5,000. It's, it's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. It's extraordinary. Not just 5,000 people, but 5,000 men, which means heads of households. So Jesus fed 5,000 families. And the next day, it's not surprising, the crowds came back and they, they wanted seconds. And Jesus fed them, not with bread and fish, but with the word of God. And he preached this sermon. It's pretty extraordinary. You can still read it today. It was recorded in John chapter six. And this was, in my estimation, the worst sermon Jesus ever preached. Now, now don't stone me. The reason I say that is he started with 5,000 families in the audience. By the end of it, there were 12, not 12 families, 12 people, his most loyal leaders. And here was the sticking point for them when Jesus said, I'll read it, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, that's a hard statement because Jesus is saying, it's not ritual cannibalism, it is absolute loyalty. You, you have to, when you come to Jesus, you have to say, you are my source of nourishment. You are my life, no other. He doesn't just want to be number one, he wants to be the only one that is your source of self-esteem and, and, and your source of, of truth and your source of identity. <laughs> the crowds said in verse 60, on hearing it, uh, they said, this is, a, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And most of them didn't. A few verses later, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus looks around the room at his 12 leaders and he goes, um, you guys don't want to leave me too, do you? And Simon, Peter, who's not known for his brilliant repartee, had a moment of genius. And here's what he said. 
Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It was this statement, 40 years ago for me, that was my Rubicon. I grew up in California in the 70s, and look, there are a lot of other options for a young man in the 70s in California. I chose to forego the free sex of the 70s. I, I forego, like, weed was gratuitous everywhere. Like, I, I chose to, to not go that route. I chose to follow after Jesus. I had these offers from colleges to go to high-paying jobs, but God called me to ministry. If that's not what he's called you to do, then don't do it. But he, that was my call. And I decided back then that there would be no other option for me but following Jesus wherever he led me and whatever he asked me to do. Here's what's interesting about Peter and Julius Caesar, 80 years apart, but if you were to stand them next to each other in their own day, one's a fisherman from a backwater of Israel, the other became the first emperor of Rome, and you were to ask, which of these is going to impact the world more? Nobody would have chosen Simon. Nobody. But do you realize that at the end of their lives, they were both buried in the same city. In fact, they're less than two miles apart, their tombs. And if you go to Rome today, you can go through the forum and your tour guide will show you the burial place of Julius Caesar. If you look at it closely, you can see the coins that tourists have thrown on the place where he was laid to rest. That was Julius Caesar. Just two miles up the road, the apostle Peter was crucified. Then when they crucified him, he said, I don't deserve to die like my Lord. So according to tradition, they turned him upside down and crucified him upside down. And on that spot today, they built a church. This is what Julius Caesar's tomb looks like. This is what Peter's looks like. You see the difference? The reason I don't want to be an emperor is not because, well, I can't, I don't, I know how history judges rulers of the world. I would rather be a servant of Christ than a ruler of the world because this is where the difference is. This, this church was not built in honor of Peter, it was built in honor of Jesus. And I wanna ride on those coattails in the updraft of his honor to have my life matter beyond my life. And if that's who you are, and I think that is because you're here on New Year's, then the way to do that is to burn the ships, to cross the Rubicon of your life and make a decision, there are no other options for me. That's not just <laughs> what that's not just what I would advise you to do. This is what Jesus demands from you. The, these are his words from Matthew chapter 16. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You know, the cross is it, not an inconvenience. It is an instrument of torture and death. Nobody picks up a cross and then turns back around to tell about it. Well, there was one. And when we take his cross, we also receive his resurrection. Jesus goes on, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. That's what I'm betting on. That's why I'm putting all chips on the table of Christ and saying, you, you have me. Everything that I am, I will leave no other options available but to follow Christ hard. And if you want to turn a new habit into an old habit, you do it by burning the ships. And specifically, there are a number of ships that I've had to burn. I'm gonna share three of my ships. You may have your own, but my guess is that all of us have these ships that we need to burn. The first one for me is excuses. Now, I don't wanna brag, but I'm about the best I know at making excuses. Anyone else? 
I can come up with an excuse for anything. Like, the, all of us have excuses for not coming to church. There's something else going on, like, right now that you could be going to. All of us have excuses for not serving. All of us have excuses for not joining a group. All of us have excuses for not being baptized. Like, we all have excuses. But do you have one reason that will trump every excuse that you can come up with. Because until you find that one reason, your excuses are going to dominate you. There, I wanna be very specific with you about one of my excuses. Because in our next steps here at CCV, uh, we talk about uh, going all in with Jesus in baptism. We, we talk about uh, sharing your faith with others, about tithing, about serving, about uh, attending church, about worshiping. The one that's most difficult for me, honestly, this might surprise you, is sharing my faith. And it's not because I'm ashamed of Jesus or I don't know how to explain the gospel or don't want to. It's that, and this is occupational hazard, me and Ashley both struggle with this, the vast majority of our time is spent at church or with people who've come to church. And so for me to meet unchurched people is probably more difficult than most of you. That's the excuse. It's a good excuse, but it's an excuse that needs to be burned. Because until you decide that 2023 will be the year, there are no excuses. Like I'm gonna be at church or if I'm on vacation, I'll find a local church, I'll watch online. There are no excuses for not being at church, for not reading my Bible, for not praying, for not following Jesus, for not sharing my faith. I will work at finding opportunities to share my faith with people who are disconnected from God. And until I do, it's gonna be easy for me to retreat because I'll leave an open option. And I know how Jesus responds to excuses. In fact, I, I wanna read a passage to you uh, where a man came up to Jesus and said, I wanna follow you, but, but, his excuse was way better than any excuse that, that you've come up with. He said, Lord, let me go and bury my father that's Matthew 8, verse 21. For a Jew, burying your father was the most sacred duty you had. It would trump offering a sacrifice at an altar in Jerusalem. It would trump prayer. It would trump fasting. It would trump anything else. To bury your father was a duty of religion. It was a religious duty for you. Here's how Jesus responded. This is one of the most offensive things that Jesus ever said. Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, here's probably what's going on. When a person died in the first century, they didn't have formaldehyde. So they would bury them immediately like that day. So the dude's dad isn't dead. Or, or maybe his dad already died and he's waiting for the year period of mourning to be over. And they would take the bones uh, after the body had decayed and put them in a sarcophagus and, and, and just put them in the family tomb. Maybe he's waiting for the period of mourning, but either way, if you're waiting for your dad to die, who knows when that will be? Or you're waiting for the period of mourning to be over. By the time you follow Jesus, he is gone. Today is the day for you to make a decision that you're gonna go all in with Jesus. No excuses. It's time to burn this ship. There's a second ship that we need to burn. And honestly, this one was burned for me 40 years ago. Because I had to make a decision of whether I was gonna be loyal, and it wasn't loyal to my mom or my dad, it was whether I was gonna be loyal to Jesus above anybody else. Jesus said that because of me, families will be divided two against three and three against two. We had five people in my family. It was literally that, two who followed Jesus and three that didn't. I had to make this decision a long time ago. And this includes my wife, my children, like anybody else. They cannot have my ultimate loyalty. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't love people. It doesn't mean that I ghost people. It doesn't mean that I'm unkind to people. It just means that nobody gets to determine the direction of my life but Jesus Christ. No one can steer the ship. No one can stop my progress. No one can get me moving in a different trajectory but Jesus and Jesus alone. 
And for some of you, you're still at that Rubicon where you need to decide because you've got a lover that you love them, but they don't love Jesus. And they're causing you to go a different direction from Jesus. You gotta burn that ship. For some of you, that might even be a spouse. Or for a lot of people, seriously, it's a child. So many people are living vicariously through their children that your identity is wrapped up in their sport or in their academics. Some, some of you are so involved with your kid's life that they become the excuse for not following Christ. Jesus was very clear about that. In a culture where family was way more influential, way more devoted to one another than our culture, Jesus had this to say about being loyal to families. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and following. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And it might be time for you to burn this ship so that no one can determine the direction of your life but Jesus alone. This last ship, for me, this is the hardest one. It is the ship of control. I think all of us have an inner two-year-old where we put our hands on our ship, hips and say, I, I will do it myself. We want to control our own destiny. This goes back to the Garden of Eden. This is exactly why Eve took a bite of the, of the forbidden fruit. Because she wanted to be like God. She wanted to be the one on the throne of her life. She wanted to be the one determining her direction. And so many of us, we just need control of our lives. We demand it. We want to be our own gods, our own authorities, our own Caesars. You cannot have control of your own life and call Jesus Lord. He demands that you take his cross and put it on your back and take that one-way journey to death. And the strange thing about his cross is it may be the only route to life for you. We, we try to take control through our jobs. I, I can make money and I can, I can be in control of my insurance and my home and my car. I can take care of my family myself. We, we want to take control of our own relationships where we're, we're going we're gonna to solve problems without the help of other people, without the help of the church, and certainly without the direction of Jesus. Some of you right now are struggling because you're trying to control your adult children. And you just realize how futile that is to try to control anybody else, even yourself. There's a story I want to read to you from the Old Testament. It's about the greatest prophet of all the Old Testament. Elijah was the senior. It is spelled with a J. And when it's time to pass the baton on to his successor, it was Elisha with an S-H. And as the story goes, Elijah, he's about to be taken up in a flaming chariot to heaven. Like God has taken him for himself. It's a, like a wild Uber ride up to heaven in a flaming chariot. And he comes across Elisha, who's a farmer. Elisha wound up doing twice the miracles of Elijah. He asked God for a double portion of God's power that even Elijah, the fabled prophet, had. And God gave it to him. And I want to show you why. Here's the story. 1 Kings chapter 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing, he was plowing a 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. 
Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. That's a, a symbol of giving him the leadership and authority of his ministry. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come and, and, and be with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? In other words, I'm not keeping you from saying goodbye to your family. Go, go say goodbye. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. The reason God honored Elisha's request of a double portion of Elijah's power is because he was willing to burn the yokes. He didn't just take his, this is with the tools of his trade. He didn't just burn them. He took the animals that, that pulled the yokes and, and pulled the plow. He took them and sacrificed them and fed the community. This was like an all-in gamble. If I'm following after God and because God saw his faith, he gave him a double portion. So those of you here right now on New Year's, Plenty of other excuses, plenty of other places to be, but you've chosen to be here. I believe it's because you don't just want to be blessed by God. You want to bless God and want your life to matter. And the way you're going to make a new habit into an old habit is to burn the plows, to burn the ships, to cross the Rubicon, and truly make Jesus Lord. It's time for you to give up the control of your life. And in my experience, the hardest part of control for people to give up is their past. We tend to hold on to shame. And it's like, a, like, an, like an ankle weight that just keeps us from taking the next steps for Christ. We, we, we want to go all in. In, in the next five weeks, we're going to have a whole sermon series on going all in. But you need to give up control of your life, even control of your shame and your regret from the past. Look, we've all had these shameful moments, these memories that plague us. But Jesus, through his blood, took that away from you. You have no right to hold on to the shame of your past that Jesus himself has taken away. It's time to burn that ship and claim the promise of Romans 8, 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I have a, a friend of mine who wants to be baptized, but he's waiting until he gets his life in order. <laughs> Look, you, you don't clean up to get baptized. Baptism cleans you up. It is the, is the grace of Jesus, his blood, that washes you clean and allows you to live a life that honors God. It's time to give up control and to burn that ship. Holy Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give the power to every man, woman, and child who hears my voice to give up control of their own life and to let you truly be the Lord of their lives. We yield to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Happy New Year.